gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. certain shepherds brought tidings of the same how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name oh tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy oh tidings of comfort and joy Welcome to Marsh Creek Community Church. My name is John Wrights and I'm serving this congregation as interim pastor. Greetings to those of you who call Marsh Creek your home congregation, as well as to those of you who may be visiting our site from somewhere nearby or far away. I'm glad you have decided to listen in, and I'm hoping you find your time with us meaningful for you. I invite you to ponder again the meaning of Christmas and God's love for you.
Christmas shopping has been very different this year in our household. It's just my wife and I, and we both have found ourselves doing almost all of our shopping online. It goes something like this. We'll order things, and in a few days, packages will show up at our door. In order to not ruin any surprises, we only handle the packages with our name on it. When packages come with my name on them, I take them, I hide them for later wrapping. It's become a rather automated system. Order, deliver, hidden, wrapped. All of that was going fine until just over a week ago, this package arrived on our porch. I looked at the label and it had my name on it. So of course I took it inside and I opened it up. And inside I found a book. Now by now I had begun forgetting what things I had purchased. And I had remembered that my wife had liked a book we saw. So I didn't think another thing of it. I thought this was the book. I had some extra time, so I got some wrapping paper and thought I would get it wrapped. I took the book out of the box and saw a paper slip in the bottom of the box. I was curious, so I picked it up and found there were other papers there as well. Needless to say, I had bought the book from my wife. It was a gift sent to me for my birthday from my daughter and her family. We all had a really good laugh over that one. I tell you that story to lead into the message that I'd like to share with you today. Sometimes, as followers of Jesus, we can fall into ruts like I did and get caught in an automatic, automated system. We're so used to passing God's gift along to others that we can miss the fact that it was actually addressed to us. Now, there's no doubt that God's gift of love is needed by our world, but it's also needed by us. You see, this year, the year 2020, is a year that a whole lot of love has been erased out of the world. Have you noticed? This year I've counseled people who have been cut off from their family because of intense political divide. And so some families are no longer talking to one another. Some families don't want anything to do with people that are their own flesh and blood. You'd almost have to be living on a different planet to not be aware of all of the meanness and ugliness of the past year. We've been living with some of the greatest expressions of racism since I was a young boy. The love has been sucked out of the world and violence has filled the void. At least that's what it seems like. And then there's the mixture of a pandemic with political upheaval and it has damaged the greatest expression of love which is sacrifice on behalf of other people. There's not a lot of sacrifice happening these days. 
This year has reminded me a lot of the year 1965 when I was an 11 year old boy. That was another year when the world seemed like it was on fire. That year was the start of the Vietnam War and all of the protest that went along with it. That was also the year that persons of color were being denied immigration. The Watts riots took place in Los Angeles that year due to the racial struggle between police and persons of color. The Voting Rights Act did its best to deal with racial discrimination in voting. But it didn't go quite far enough, and that was the same year that there was that march to Selma. You can see why I say that year was a lot like this year. Well, it's interesting. In that year, two things hit the airwaves that helped to get people focused on the true meaning of Christmas. The first one was a Charlie Brown Christmas. Charles Schultz found that only about 9% of Christmas specials dealt with the true meaning of Christmas. And so he put together this show, A Charlie Brown Christmas, that had strategically placed in the show the telling of the Christmas story. That has become sort of a classic every year. I just saw it this past week playing again and again and again. That same year, there was a story that became a regular part of a radio show. The radio host was a man by the name of Paul Harvey. Some of you are old enough to remember Paul Harvey. That year he told a story and it reminded people of a very important truth. I want to play you that story with Paul Harvey telling it. And I invite you to listen in because it was told in a year very much like ours where people in general needed to be reminded of the meaning of Christmas. Take a listen in. The man I'm talking about was not a Scrooge now. He was a kind, a decent, a mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men, but he just did not believe in all of that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. He told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm just not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now, shortly after the family drove away and the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair, began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, then yet another. At first he thought somebody must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled out there miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm in a desperate search for shelter. They had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sound. Well, he couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze. So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes, and he tramped through the deepening snow to the barn, and he opened the doors wide. And inside the barn, he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So 
He figured that food would entice them. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow, making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction, every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange, terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now, if I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid, then I could show them the way to the safe warm barn but I would have to be one of them wouldn't I so they could see and hear and understand at that moment the church bells began to ring the sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind and he stood there listening to the bells at Deste Fidelis listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas and he sank to his knees in the snow Paul Harvey, I hope for you and those you love, this will be a wonderfully Merry Christmas. Paul Harvey used this simple story to remind people in the midst of a crazy year that God wants to be known and had a special delivery to all of humankind. That special delivery is mentioned in the Gospel of John this way. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. If you continue in that same Gospel, it's told again, but told as an expression of God's love. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Just a little later, it also says this, in case you didn't catch the story. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God wants us to know that among all of the disagreements, among all of the protests, among all of the suffering and death, among all the love being erased, God wants to remind you and me that we are loved. And God wants to remind us that that gift is for us. Before we can ever love other people, it's important to know that we are loved. So for a few minutes, let's unpack the gift that was sent to us. In 1952, J.B. Phillips published a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. In it, he describes various images that people have of God. It's sort of like how the birds in the story, that story that was told by Paul Harvey, how the birds saw the man. 
not as a helper, but someone to stay away from. And J.B. Phillips was trying to help people understand what God wasn't like, so they might be able to understand who God is. And so he had various descriptions that people use of God. Resident policeman, a parental hangover, a grand old man, a managing director, absolute perfection. Altogether, Phillips gave 12 small representations of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, John gives a simple yet profound description of God. In that passage, he says, God is love. Now, I want you to think with me, if J.B. Phillips were writing a book on us, he might entitle it, Your Love is Too Small. You see, Jesus was sent to earth to show us what love is. Jesus is love in the flesh. Everything, everything that you and I have ever read in the Gospels are a manifestation of love. Every act is an act of love. If you and I want to know the character of God, it is love. You see, God came to show the people he created what love is. I'd go so far as to say, love isn't being erased in 2020 but the imitations of love are being erased. You see, there's a lot of imitations of love. And the way you know the imitations of love is what you need to do to get love. And so listen to some of these expressions. I love you when, and you could fill in the rest of that sentence. I love you if, and you could fill in the rest of that sentence. I love you because there's things that you do or the way that you look or all kinds of reasons. I love you because of that. Or I love you as long as you do what I want you to do. Or I love you provided that something happens. It's very interesting when you sort of pause and realize God's love is based on God's nature, not on our actions. In Romans 5.8, it says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God loves you and me because that's God's nature, not because of how good we are. Now, some of you listening are carrying storyline from your past or even from your present that has filled you with shame and guilt. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but it can take a big place in your mind and your heart. And so things that you've done wrong or things that you've omitted to do can really take a big part of your storyline. This gift, this gift of love delivered in the person of Jesus is a gift for you and for me. And so if there's anything that you're carrying Will you let God forgive you? It's his gift to you. Maybe you're like the birds in the story, keeping your distance from God, while God wants to save you. Maybe you've been passing God's love on to other people, 
when the gift is really for you. We are about to close out the year 2020. I think most would say it's been a tough year. I'm reminded of a book of the Bible that talks about extreme difficulty. In fact, it is written in Hebrew meter of a funeral dirge. And as you would read it in Hebrew, it's like you're listening to a funeral dirge. It talks about people being distressed. It talks about people being left with many wounds because of things that have happened. It talks about a group of people that are experiencing all kinds of shortages. People who are shedding tears. It's a time when the young and the old were both dying. And one of the expressions that's used is that people were being walled in. Sound familiar? People were being deprived of peace. And it talks about people having a soul that was downcast. If you haven't guessed by now, it's the book of Lamentations. Smack dab in the middle of that book is a reminder of the character of God. I can't think of a better thing to close with today. Lamentations 3, 22 and 24 says this. Now in the midst of a year much more difficult than the year that we had, this is found right in the middle of this book. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. You see, once you have received the gift of love, only then are you in a place to share that love with others. Let's pray.